The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life by Drunvelo Melchizedek, Volume 1 Chapter 4 the aborted evolution of consciousness and the creation of the Christ grid sacred sites. After starting the new grid over the existing collapsed grid and putting one pyramid on the line of the spiral, Thoth, Ra and Rugat mapped where these two energy lines curved and crossed each other in over 83,000 places on the surface of the earth. Fourth dimensionally, one dimension higher than this one, they constructed an entire network of buildings and structures over the whole planet placing them on the nodes of this energy matrix. All of these structures were laid out with the proportions of either the golden mean or Fibonacci spirals, and all were mathematically referred back to that single point in Egypt now called the Solar Cross. The location of the sacred sites of the world are no accident. It was a single consciousness that created every single one of them, from Picchu to Stonehenge to Zagwan, you name it, to anywhere. Almost all of them with a few exceptions, were created by a single awareness. We're becoming more aware of this now. Richard Hoagland's work brings this forth, though he wasn't the first one. They show how one sacred site is extrapolated from another one, then another and still another. These sites go beyond time, in that they were all built at different times, and they go beyond any particular culture or geographical location. They were obviously done by one consciousness who coordinated the whole enterprise. Eventually researchers will see that this spot in Egypt is the point from which all the other sacred sites were calculated. This Egyptian area, is the North Pole of the Unity Consciousness Grid. On the other side of the planet, out in the South Pacific in the Tahitian Islands, is a little island called Morea where the south pole of the grid is located. For those of you who have been on top of Wainapichu for a bird's eye view, Makupichu, at about 9000 feet in the Peruvian mountains, seems to be surrounded in a perfect circle by mountains. It's like a female circle surrounding a phallus rising in the middle. Well, the island of Morea is similar to this, only it's shaped like a heart. Each house on Morea has a heart with house number on it. The phallic Morean mountain in the center of the heart is much bigger than Wainapichu in Peru, but you will still see the same ring of mountains surrounding this earthen pole. This is the precise south pole of the entire unity consciousness grid. If you go straight through the earth at Morea, you come out in Egypt. It's off only an ever so tiny bit. There's a very slight curve, which is natural. The Morean pole is negative, or female, and the Egyptian pole is positive, or male. All the sacred sites are connected to the Egyptian pole, and they're all interlinked through the central axis leading to Morea. It's a Taurus, of course, the pyramid's landing platform and the ship beneath the Sphinx. This is the Great Pyramid, figure 47. It has a so-called missing capstone and there have been all kinds of speculations about it. According to Thoth, the actual missing capstone is 51 halves inches high and solid gold, it is a holographic image of the entire pyramid. In other words, it has all the little rooms in it and everything in proportion, and it's sitting in the hall of records. The other two pyramids go up to a sharp point, only the great pyramid has a flat surface on top. That missing piece is not little, it's about 24 feet square at the base. If you get on top, it's a huge platform. This flat area is actually a landing platform for a very special airship that exists on Earth. The Sphinx is not far away from the Great Pyramid. According to the Emerald Tablets and Thoth, the Sphinx is much, much older than the 10 to 15 thousand years estimated by John Anthony West. One factor that many present researchers have neglected to consider is that the Sphinx has been under sand during most of its recent existence. In fact, when Napoleon went to see the Sphinx, he didn't even know it was there because all he saw was its head. It was completely buried, and it has been buried for most of the last few hundred years at least. Taking that factor into consideration, which could be a major one, the wear caused by rain and wind would have taken a lot longer than they're presently figuring. According to Thoth, the Sphinx goes back at least five and a half million years. I guess eventually that will be brought forth, because he hasn't been wrong about anything yet. Even John Anthony West secretly suspects that it is a great deal older than 10 to 15 thousand years. He wasn't concerned with making speculations into the millions of years, 
he just wanted to get it well past the 6,000 year mark, because that will crack our previously accepted Earth history. He and his team have now done that, and later, I believe, they'll try to push the date back further as they introduce more evidence. According to Thoth, approximately one mile under the Sphinx there is a round room with a flat floor and a flat ceiling. Inside this room is the oldest synthetic object in the world, older than any other consciously assembled matter on Earth. According to Thoth, though even he can't prove it, this object goes back 500 million years when that which led to human life began. The object is about two city blocks in size, it's round like a disc and has a flat bottom and top. It's unusual in that its skin is only three to five atoms thick. Its top and bottom surfaces have a certain pattern that's shown in figure 48. The pattern itself is five atoms thick, everywhere else it's only three atoms thick. And it's transparent, you can see right through it, almost like it's not there. This is a ship but it has no motors or visible form of power. Even though Doriel's interpretation of the Emerald Tablets states that this ship had atomic motors in it, according to Thoth it does not. Doriel translated the Emerald Tablets in the Yucatan in 1925 and could not understand the description of how the ship was powered. The idea of atomic motors was the farthest out idea he could think of for a power source. But it is actually propelled by thoughts and feelings and is designed to connect with and extend your own living Merkabah. This ship is connected directly to the spirit of the earth, and in the emerald tablets it's called a warship. It was the protector for the earth, the vulnerability of this period and the appearance of the heroine. Every single time we reach that vulnerable point in the procession of the equinoxes when our poles make these little shifts, extraterrestrials have tried to take over the planet, according to the emerald tablets. This has been going on for millions and millions of years, and it's still going on. When I read that in the tablets, I didn't yet know about the greys or any of these beings, and I thought, someone coming from somewhere else to take over the earth, nor, this is silly. But even today, this same thing's going on. It never stops, it just keeps on. It's called, simply, the battle of the dark and the light. Every single time a takeover seems imminent, there has always been one very pure person who figures out how to get into the next level of consciousness, then finds the ship and raises it into the air. The earth and the sun connect within that person and give him or her great power, then whatever that person thinks and feels will happen. That's how this airship is a warship, whatever races are trying to take over earth, this person just thinks them away thinks up a situation that forces them to leave. This keeps our evolutionary process going without any kind of outside interference or influence. At least that's what is supposed to happen. By now we have definitely been tampered with. That pure person has appeared, and that event has already happened here on earth. This is why the greys are leaving. The problems they're having is because of one single woman, one 23 year old female from Peru. She was 23 in 1989 when she did this. She made the first ascension process up to the new grid and connected with it, connected with the earth, found the ship and raised it into the air. First, she made some basic connections that had to be done with crystals on the earth, then performed the programming that had to be recalculated. The very next thing she did was to think that the greys and others related to this attempted takeover of earth were going to become sick if they remained here and there would be no cure. Within one month, all the greys started getting sick, and the whole process she envisioned began to happen. The greys have been forced to leave the earth now. Their bases have been abandoned, and they have been forced to alter their plans. The presence of this entire army of beings from space has now been reduced to almost nothing, all because of one small but holy woman. It's amazing, chuckles. We guys know what that's like. I've been reduced to nothing lots of times by my wife. Awaiting the Atlantean catastrophe. Thoth and his partners finished the complex in Egypt to help rebuild the grid. Then they abandoned it in the middle of the rainforest and went back to Atlantis to prepare. It sat alone for 200 years, because they knew that at that critical point in the procession of the equinoxes, the poles would shift. They knew that Atlantis would sink so they waited, one day it finally happened, the catastrophe actually took only one night, science has proven that when poles shift, 
it takes about 20 hours. It happens just like that, snaps fingers. You wake up one normal day, and that evening it's a totally different world. The whole process is about three and a half days long, but the pole shift happens in about 20 hours. We're all going to experience this enormous change when we see big chunks of the United States start to drop off into the water, then you'll know it's for sure. There are other early signs that will tip you off that the change is about to happen. When enough information has been given, I'll remind you of what you already hold in your memories. When they saw the very first signs of the shift coming on, Thoth, Ra and Araragat returned to the Sphinx and raised the warship into the sky. All they did was raise the vibration of the molecules only one overtone higher than the Earth exists on. This allowed them and the ship to pass right through the Earth into the sky. Then they moved to Atlantis, lowered the ship to the surface, and picked up the people of the Knuckle Mystery School which included the original immortals from Lemuria as well as those who became enlightened during the time of Atlantis, by that time about another 600 people had ascended. So the original thousand from Lemuria and the 600 from Atlantis had increased the number of ascended masters to about 1600, the only occupants of the ancient airship. Now, the people on this ship were not only passengers, they were creating a living group Merkaba that surrounded the ship with a very large field in the shape of a flying saucer, the same shape that surrounds the galaxy and around your body when your Merkaba is spinning. They had a very powerful protective field around themselves as they headed for Chem, soon to be the new Egypt. Thoth said that they had risen about a quarter mile off the planet with the members of the mystery school on board when they watched the island of Udal sink. This was the last piece of Atlantis to disappear into the water, with the exception of a few small islands. Then they flew the ship to Egypt and landed it on top of the Great Pyramid. From the side it looked like the middle drawing in figure 49. If you were to extend the Great Pyramid up to where the capstone would naturally terminate, you would find that the ship and the pyramid were built for each other. If you Rito look at this from the top, it would look like the right hand view in the figure. The circle is the ship and the square is the great pyramid. The perimeter of the great pyramid and the circumference of the ship are the same. It's debatable if that's possible or not, but they can get very, very close. Whenever that mathematical relationship happens, life appears. It's the basic relationship of life throughout the universe. We'll describe this geometrically soon, if the ascended masters had not had spinning Merkaba fields around them, they wouldn't be here today, and probably neither would we, because their Merkabas protected them from all that happened next. After they landed on the pyramid, the poles began to shift and the human consciousness of the earth began to plummet. Simultaneously, the electromagnetic and magnetic fields of the earth collapsed, and all life on this planet went into the great void. The three and a half days of absolute blackness described by many cultures around the world. The three and a half days of the void. The emerald tablets say that every single time we go around the procession of the equinoxes and our poles go through these changes, we go through a void space for about three and a half days. The Mayas described the void in the Troana document. At one point in the story, three and a half stones are painted black. This refers to the time when we go into what we now call the electromagnetic null zone. As the poles shift, a phenomenon takes place, we'll go into great detail about this later, where for about three and a half days we're in darkness, it could actually be anywhere from two or two and a half days to a little over four days. The last time, it was evidently three and a half days. It's more than just blackness, it's nothing, it's void. And, by the way, when you are in the void, you will realize that you and God are one, that there is no difference at all. We talk about the void again at the right moment. Memory, magnetic fields and Merkabars. If the people on the warship hadn't been protected by the Merkabar during that change, they would have completely lost their memories. You see, our memory is held together primarily by a magnetic field that exists around the brain, 
inside the skull and around the head. That field is further connected to every cell in the brain by individualized magnetic fields within each cell. Science first found the internal magnetic particles within each cell and then found the larger outer field. This was the first new find in human physiology in the last 300 years. Memory is dependent on a steady, living magnetic field very much like a computer. Its connection to the Earth's magnetic field is not understood by science at this time. If you don't have a means of protecting your memory, it will be raised, gone. It'll be like unplugging a computer in the middle of a file. It's just gone. That's exactly what happened to the Atlanteans and others who survived the catastrophe but who didn't have spinning Merkabars. Those very sophisticated people, who were more advanced than you and I suddenly found themselves in a situation where they didn't know anything. They had high-tech bodies and high-tech minds, but it was like having a great PC sitting on the table with no software, nothing there. So the population that survived, and there were a few, had to start all over again. They had to begin at square one to figure out how to stay warm how to make fire and so on. This loss of memory was the result of their forgetting how to breathe, forgetting their merkabars, forgetting everything, falling down through the dimensions, going into a totally unprotected state and ending up in this very dense world, having to eat food again, doing all kinds of things that hadn't been part of our experience for a very long time. They were slammed into a very dense aspect of the planet and had to learn to survive all over again. This was all a result of the synthetic Merkabah experiment that had taken place on Atlantis. Without that small group of ascended masters, we would not have survived at all, we definitely would all have left human experience. The whole Earth experiment would have been over forever. But they kept the field alive, just barely while everything else crashed around them. Besides the ascended masters, there were also two other groups on earth who had Merkabah fields intact at the time. The Nephilim and the Syrians, our mother and father, kept their fields alive. I don't know where the Nephilim retreated to within this planet's dimensional worlds, but the Syrians remained in the halls of Amenti, inside the inner earth. Both of these groups are still here on the planet, hidden within the dimensional worlds. What the Thoth group did after light returned. After the three and a half days of darkness, the earth reappeared, light reappeared, the fields stabilized themselves, and we were down in this third dimensional world where we are now. Everything was new and different, everything. It had totally changed experientially. When we consider the landmass of Atlantis, the Atlanteans had really been on a much higher level of interpreting that landmass. They didn't experience it like we do. It was experienced in a totally different way that's pretty hard to explain from a third dimensional point of view. After they landed on top of the Great Pyramid, Ra and about a third of the people from the ship went down through a tunnel that goes into a room at the two thirds level, which will someday be discovered. They've discovered four new rooms in the Great Pyramid in only the last few years. When this room is discovered, they'll find that it's made with red black and white stones, which were the primary architectural colors of Atlantis. This is what Thoth told me to say. From this room is a channel they used to descend to a city or a temple far below the pyramid, which Thoth and friends built when they built the pyramid. It was designed to hold approximately 10,000 people because they knew a large number would ascend over the next 13,000 years until the day of purification. After the fields stabilized and a third of the people followed Ra into the room made of red, black and white stones, from there they entered the underground city and began the route of our present civilization. Another part of the route was being formed at the same time in Sumer, another story. At the same moment in time, the remaining 1067 or so ascended masters lifted the warship off the Great Pyramid and flew to the place now called Lake Titicaca, where they landed on the Island of the Sun, in Bolivia. Thoth got off there, along with about a third of the people. Then they took off again and flew to the Himalayan mountains, where Araragat got off with the remaining third of the people. Seven people, however, remained with the ship flew it back to the Sphinx and lowered it into that room, where it has remained for the last 13,000 years, 
until recently when the young woman from Peru raised it again into the open blue skies of Mother Earth's atmosphere. Sacred sites on the grid, Egypt became the male component of the grid, that is where the male structures were laid out. There's hardly any femaleness that compared to female areas of the world. Of course, the polarity to maleness does exist. Isis is that counterpart, but the overall energy flow is male. South America, especially Peru, Central America and also parts of Mexico became the female component of the grid. However, ultimately the entire female aspect of the grid became centered at the complex in Uxal, in the Yucatan, where many survivors from Atlantis had found refuge. Starting at Uxal, seven temples are laid out in a spiral, probably a Fibonacci spiral, and they are the seven primary temples of the female component of the grid. These are chakra centers, just like the chakra centers that are laid out down the length of the Nile. These feminine centers begin with Uxal, then go to Labna, then to Kaaba, then over to Chichen Itza, then over to Tulum near the ocean, then way down near Belize to Koyun Lich curving back inland to Palenque. Those seven places created the primary spiral of the feminine aspect of the grid being created for our new Christ consciousness, which we are only now able to access. From Palenque the feminine aspect of the grid splits north and south. Here we see another polarization of the energy. The feminine component of the female spiral of the grid heads south and jumps over to Tikal in Guatemala and that begins a new octave. When we relate it to music, the seventh sight bridges to the eighth note, or the beginning of the next octave of the next spiral. And the spiral keeps going south through the feminine component of the grid. Eventually it moves through places like Machu Picchu and Saxe Woman near Cusco, Peru. One of the main spirals ends in a place called Chavin, in Peru, which was the primary religious center of the Lincoln Empire. From there it goes to Lake Titicaca to a place about a half a mile off the island of the sun in Bolivia. Then it makes a 90 degree turn and heads out toward Easter Island and finally to Morea, where it anchors into the earth. Heading north from Palenque is the male component of the female aspect of the grid. It goes through the Aztec ruins and up through the American Indian pyramids. The American Indians made physical pyramids some remains of which can be seen in and around Albuquerque, New Mexico, then the spiral continues to Blue Lake Nietos, New Mexico, which is the counterpart of Lake Titicaca. This is one of the most important areas in the United States, protected for a long time by the Toes Indians. Again, there's a 90 degree turn at Blue Lake, from the the spiral heads out across their mountains, going through Ute Mountain on the New Mexico side of the Colorado border, and through many mountains and structures that have been built. In conjunction with the sacred sites, the creators also used mountains because of their vortex energy. Finally, before the spiral leaves the coast of California, it passes through Lake Tahoe, Donner Lake and Pyramid Lake. From there it goes through underwater mountain complexes until it reaches the Hawaiian Islands, where Haley Cala Crater is one of the primary components then heads south again. It goes through the Hawaiian island chain that connects for thousands of miles all the way back to Moria. So it's a huge open circle that comes around the earth, starting at Uxmal and connecting at the south pole of the Christ grid. The feminine component of the grid is a massive circle of complexes. Understand that in between each of the major sites mentioned above are literally hundreds of smaller sites, churches and temples of many religions, sacred sites of nature such as mountain peaks and ranges, lakes, canyons and so on. If you could see the greater plan, you would see how they form perfect spirals, first moving clockwise, then moving counterclockwise until they reach their destination, Morea, in the South Pacific. The pyramids built in the Himalayan mountains were primarily crystalline in nature, meaning they were constructed by using third-dimensional crystals at the corners, aimed to form a pyramid. They built physical pyramids there, too, lots of them. Most of them are not known, though some are. The largest known pyramid in the world so far is in the western mountains of Tibet. It's a solid white pyramid that's in almost perfect condition, with a huge, solid crystal capstone. At least two teams of scientists have been there, and it has also been photographed from the air.
It's visible only three weeks out of the year when its crystal capstone peers out of the deep snow to view a valley long deserted from human endeavor. I talked with the leader of the team that went into this pyramid. He said it looks like a brand new pyramid and that there's nothing written on the walls. It's white, smooth and hard, like marble. When they entered it, they went down a long tunnel, where they found a large room in the center. There's no writing anywhere, no designs know nothing, except that in the middle, high up on a wall, there is one inscription, the flower of life, that's it. If you want to say everything, all you have to do is put that on a wall, that says it all. By the end of this book you'll understand why. All the sacred sites on earth, with a few exceptions, were planned on a fourth dimensional level by higher consciousness, and by now most of third dimensional counterparts connected to them, in other words, real buildings on real sites. However, there are still some very important sites that have only fourth dimensional structures. Those fourth dimensional pyramids primarily represent the neutral or child energy of the Christ grid. Altogether there are three aspects of the Christ grid that surround the earth, mother, father and child. The father is in Egypt, the mother is in Peru Yucatan South Pacific and the child is in Tibet. The five levels of human consciousness and their chromosomal differences. According to Thoth, there are five different levels of human consciousness possible here on earth. These are people who have different DNA, completely different bodies and different ways of perceiving the reality. Each level of consciousness grows from the last one until finally on the fifth level humanity learns how to translate into a whole new manner of expressing life, leaving earth forever. The primary visual difference between these types is their height, the first level people are about four to six feet tall, the second level people are about five to seven feet tall, where we are at now, third level people are about ten to sixteen feet tall, which we are about to translate to, the fourth level being is about 30 to 35 feet tall, and the last is about 50 to 60 feet, these last two levels are for the distant future, this may seem strange at first, but do we not begin as a microscopic egg and get larger and larger until we are born, then we continue to grow taller and taller until we are adults, according to this theory, the human adult is not the end of our growth pattern, we continue through DNA steps until we are 50 to 60 feet tall. Metatron, the Hebrew Archangel who is the perfection of what humanity is supposed to become, is 55 feet tall. Remember the giants who lived here on earth referred to in chapter 6 of Genesis? According to the Sumerian records, they were about 10 to 16 feet tall. When we look at a 3 year old and a 10 year old, we know that they have different levels of consciousness and it is primarily by the height that we make this judgment. According to Thoth, each level of consciousness has different DNA, however, the primary difference is the number of chromosomes. Using this theory, we are now on the second level and have 44 plus 2 chromosomes. An example of the first level is certain aboriginal tribes in Australia where they have 42 plus 2 chromosomes. On the third level, which we are about to move to, people have 46 plus 2 chromosomes. The next two levels have 48 plus 2 and 50 plus 2, respectively. We will discuss this in depth in the second volume of this book and show the sacred geometry around this understanding, which will make it clear. The evidence in Egypt for a new look at history. We're now going to focus on Egypt because Egypt happens to be where the main mystery school was located and where evidence of the different sized humans and levels of consciousness, still remain, though generally unrecognized, Egypt was the area they chose where they would ultimately restore our consciousness, and the primary area where survivors from Atlantis and the Ascended Masters were in one place. We could discuss the history of those other areas, and we will a little, but the focus for this work will be on the Father because it is through the father that the primary information of the Merkabah must be remembered. Figure 410 Bust of Tia This is an Egyptian statue of Tia, Figure 410. Tia and her husband A were the first two to create a baby by interdimensionally connecting through the sacred Dantra, which leads to immortality for all three, the father, the mother and the child. You can get a pretty good idea what Lemurians looked like from looking at her. She and her husband are still alive, 
and they're still on the planet today even after tens of thousands of years. They're two of the oldest beings in the world and two of the most respected of all the ascended masters because of all they've done for human consciousness. Giants in the land. This is Abu Simbel, figure 411, in Egypt which is located at the base of the spine in the chakra system of the masculine aspect of the Christ grid. Notice how very tall these statues are, this was the actual height of these beings. Compare it to the size of the tourists near the bottom right in the photo. If these stone folks were to stand up, they would be in that 60 foot range, which indicates that they were at the fifth level of consciousness. These beings, figure 412, on a different wall at Abu symbol would be about 35 feet tall, representing the fourth level of consciousness. They built rooms for these different heights. This doorway is made for the Venusians, the Hathor race, who are on the third level of consciousness. I'll tell you more about the Hathors later. These third level beings, figure 413, are about 16 feet tall, indicating they are male as the females of this race are about 10 to 12 feet tall. In their section of the building the rooms are around 20 feet high, with ceilings and beams in proportion to 10 to 16 foot tall beings. Next to that room, through a little door figure 413, inside Abu Simbel, third level beings. Figure 412, Abu Simbel and Hathor doorway, you can't see it here, that looks like it's made for us is a little room with a much lower ceiling. The Egyptians didn't make these statues arbitrarily, they never did anything arbitrarily. There isn't a single scratch on a single stone, there is not even one, I believe, that was done unconsciously. There was a reason and a purpose for everything. And usually it was created on many, many different levels. The emerald tablets, for example, are written on 100 levels of consciousness. Depending on who you are, you'll understand something utterly and completely different from other people. If you should go through a consciousness change, go back and reread the emerald tablets again. You won't believe it's the same book, because it'll talk to you in a different way, depending on your understanding. These are earth beings, figure 414, passing through the various levels of consciousness. In this photo you see a huge 55 foot tall being with a statue our size standing by his leg. This is the king and queen. Archaeologists don't know how to interpret this, so they just say that the kings were more important than the queens, and that's why they made her little. But it didn't have anything to do with that. The statues are showing the five levels of consciousness. Every king and pharaoh who ever lived in Egypt had five names, representing the five levels of consciousness. Some of the kings and queens were able to translate between the different levels in order to guide the population into the spiritual realms. One special example of this still exists. In Egypt there's an ancient round house. I didn't get to see it but it was described to me by the famous archaeologist, Ahmed Fayh, so I know it's real. This was A and Tia's house for a long time, though they're obviously not using it now. This roundhouse has a wall down the middle. You can't get from one side of the house to the other without going outside, walking around, and coming in the other side. Does this sound like the island of Udal in Atlantis? On one side off the middle wall is a picture of I, who looks very Egyptian with his angled skirt, beard and various Egyptian paraphernalia. He appears of normal height. On the other side of the wall eyes image is about 15 feet tall. He looks very different. But you can see that his face is the same. He has a huge skull going way back like the higher level races do. I'll show you some soon. These two pictures of A show that he could go back and forth between these two different levels of awareness by changing consciousness. Stair step evolution. According to Melchizedek knowledge, both the Sumerians and the Egyptians emerged onto the surface of the earth at almost the same moment, complete, whole and perfect, with their language totally intact, with all their skills and understanding and knowledge, with almost no evolution prior to that time at least none that science knows of, they simply appeared at one moment in history in their most perfect state. The writing that came out at that moment was extremely sophisticated and clear, and has never been improved on since. After that initial impulse, these cultures became less and less clear, 
until finally these advanced civilizations degenerated away. You would think they would get better and more sophisticated as time advanced. But that's not what happened. This is scientific fact. No one in conventional archaeology knows how this happened or can even explain how it could have happened. It's a great mystery. Egypt and Sumer are placed into a special category called stair-step evolution by archaeologists. They were given this classification because of how they seemed to gain information and knowledge. What happened was, one day Egypt got its language, full and complete, then that knowledge leveled off. Then a little while later they would know everything you could possibly imagine about, perhaps, building a certain kind of moat or water system. A little more time would go by, and then they would suddenly know everything about hydraulics. It would keep going on and on like that. How did the Egyptians and the Sumerians get this information? How did they suddenly, in one day, know everything? I'll give you Thoth's answer. First I need to make this clear on the precession drawing, repeated below. Figure 415, point 2 is where we are now, and point C is when the fall of Atlantis happened. Point C is also when the poles shifted, science has determined that's when it happened. That's also when the great flood of Noah happened, and the melting of the ice caps, because of all the changes that were occurring on earth. Point C is when the destruction occurred. Remember, I mentioned earlier that there were two other points, B and D when change could also take place and be assimilated most easily. For a 6,000 year time span, from point C where the destruction happened to point D where new teachings could be given, the ascended masters had to sit and wait while the Atlanteans, who were now hairy barbarians in Egypt, slowly returned to the state where they could accept this new, yet ancient, knowledge. These approximately 1600 ascended masters had been living under the great pyramid since the fall, and they had to wait 6000 years before they could start teaching and building the new culture. The Tat Brotherhood. Thoth's son Tat remained in Egypt with Ra after the fall. Later this group became known as the Tat Brotherhood. Even today there is an external brotherhood in Egypt called the Tet Brotherhood physical people who are the protectors and keepers of the sacred temples. Hidden behind the current Tet Brotherhood are the Ascended Masters. So the immortal aspect of the Tet Brotherhood sat the waiting and waiting, observing and waiting, until the time when the Egyptians could receive their teachings. When that day finally came, which was the birth of Sumer and Egypt, the Tet Brotherhood watched until they found either a person or a group of Egyptians who were ready for the ancient knowledge. Then one, Two or three members of the Brotherhood appeared in bodies looking just like the people they were about to teach. They would go up to the surface, approach the person or group and give them the information outright. They flat out said, hey, look at this. Did you know that if you did this and this and this, that this is what will happen? The Egyptians would say, wow, look at that. They would use the knowledge thus creating a new step in their evolution. Then the men and women from the Brotherhood would go back under the pyramid, the Egyptians who were given these teachings would give it to the rest of the culture, and the culture would quickly ascend to the next step. The Egyptians would assimilate that for a while, then the Brotherhood would look for another group that was ready for the next subject. They'd go to the surface again and say, look, here's everything you want to know about this. They simply gave it to them. The Ascended Masters gave the people this information over a short period of time and their evolution simply shot up and up in stair steps. The parallel evolution in Sumer. This same evolutionary pattern was also occurring in Sumer. Though the present historical line says that Egypt began in approximately 3300 BC and Sumer began 500 years earlier, in about 3800 BC. I believe they both started at almost the same moment. I think that if historians would get their dates accurate, they'd discover that both Sumer and Egypt started only a few years apart. However, the evolution in Sumer was led by the Nephilim, the mother aspect, and the one in Egypt was led by the Syrians, the father aspect. That's the primary difference. I think the mother and the father agreed, now is the time for our children to remember. I believe it was a parental decision and that when researchers look very carefully, they too find that both countries started to blossom at the same moment in time, which was tied to their point in the precessional orbit, point D, 
when it was most likely to be successful. This is also how the Sumerians knew about the precession of the equinoxes. It takes 2160 years to recognize that there is a precession of the equinoxes, but the reason the Sumerians knew about it was because the Nephilim said, Do you know there's a precession of the equinoxes? Very simple. It's not a complicated thing. They just explained it all and the people wrote it down. The Sumerians knew about events that went back 450,000 years because they were given the information. They simply wrote it down and applied it. But after these ancient cultures got all this brilliant information, they degenerated. Why would they degenerate instead of going higher? Because they were in the sleep cycle the falling asleep portion of the procession. They were falling more and more asleep with each breath, right into the Kali Yuga, the most asleep moment of the cycle. In the middle of the Kali Yuga, 2000 years ago, was the time of Jesus, and humans were sound asleep and snoring. People in the Kali Yuga who read books and other studies written in the earlier, more awake period had a difficult time fully understanding what was being written about. Why? Because they were relatively unconscious. This is why cultures all over the world, not just in Egypt and Sumer, degenerated until they see Z. Right now we are about to awaken fully and know the truth of our beingness. Well kept secrets in Egypt, key to a new view of history. This is Saqqara, Figure 416. According to the linear archaeological belief, this is where the Egyptian culture began. This pyramid was the first to be built in Egypt, by their way of thinking. When it was first created, it was covered with beautiful white stones. In fact, this whole city stretches for miles and miles and into the earth hundreds of feet, including buildings and complexes under the ground. This would have been amazing if you could have seen it when it was brand new especially since only a short time in history before it was built, we were supposedly all hairy barbarians. There was a jump from hairy barbarians to this super sophisticated culture in only a second of archaeological time. This is a pyramid, figure 417, that I think destroys the belief that Saqqara is where it all began. This pyramid is at least 500 years older than Saqqara. If this is true, the time when the Egyptians emerged on the earth is identical to the time the Sumerians emerged, which I believe is exactly what happened. This pyramid is called Lehirat, a phonetic spelling, and it's one of the few unguarded pyramids in this category. There are quite a few of these stepped pyramids, called Mastabas. The Egyptians have taken almost all these pyramids that approach or exceed 6,000 years of age and put military bases and huge electrical fences around them. In some cases they've got soldiers on guard with machine guns. If you try to approach these pyramids, they would probably try to kill you. They don't want anyone to know about these pyramids, and they especially don't want you to examine them. If you try to talk to an Egyptian about them or ask to see them, they play it down, I went through this, they would say, or, it's not important, they're just made out of little adobe bricks by primitive people, they're nothing, nothing to them, and I'd say, well, can I go see one, nah, it's just a waste of time, don't do it, I had to keep pushing and pushing because I wanted to see one, I was brought into various governmental offices, and I kept saying, please, can I just go see one? And they would say, no, no, no. Finally I had to give bribes to get into these places. One government official wanted $8,000 to sneak me in there at night without any cameras, just to look at it for 15 minutes, then get away. This is how closely they protect these structures. Finally, after a long ordeal, I found out about one of these pyramids that was not on a military base because there was a little village around it about a half an hour from Saqqara. Once I realized that I didn't have to go through any government red tape, I finally found a person who was connected with that village. I had to pay him a lot of money, it wasn't thousands, but it was hundreds, to go there. So we drove into the little village, I had to go to the leader to ask permission and pay him money. Two. Then I was allowed to go there for 30 minutes but not take any pictures. I managed to get this one photograph, and that was all. Not only was this pyramid the, but there were pyramids all over the place everywhere, 
for what I estimated to be 10 miles around. At one time this was a major complex. They're not doing anything to take care of it because they know that this pyramid is probably older than 6,000 years. So I found out that these unimportant pyramids were not so unimportant after all. The stones that covered this pyramid, like the slanting ones shown in figure 417, probably weigh 60 to 80 tons apiece. They were very sophisticated even though the internal part of the pyramid was made with adobe bricks. On top of a block beside the base was a circle with a star of David, the key to the Merkaba experience. A ramp goes down maybe 200 feet to the river below, and the pyramid is still working, still functioning. It's pumping water. Pyramids pump water, they've demonstrated this in the United States now. If you build a pyramid right, it'll pump water with no moving parts. So this pyramid fills up with water and has to be pumped dry before anyone can enter. To top all this off, it just happened to sit next to an American linguistics team when I was flying back home, pure luck, of course, who happened to have just entered this pyramid. Very few people can go in there. But this was a team of 30. He told me about the writing inside that was definitely older than Sakkara. There is geometrical writing all over the walls. I would love to see that. This guy was very excited as he told me that this team of 30 linguistics experts who got to see the inside now believe that the key to all languages in the world is in that pyramid. I believe he's probably correct. He understood sacred geometry, and as you will soon discover, Sacred geometry is the root of all language in the universe.